Welcome to chapter 7.3, Conducting the Great War. World War I was dubbed the Great War because of the unexpected intensity and impact of the conflict and the general belief that it would be the last of its kind. In this chapter, we will take a look at uh, what made World War I so different from previous conflicts, and we will take a flying AP world history examination of the timeline of events. But first, a quick warm up from previous chapters. You have about a minute to listen to the popular war song over there by George M. Cohen while you formulate your response to the questions at the bottom of the screen. The first question is from chapter 7.2 and the second question is one that is mentioned throughout unit six. Remember that an industrial crop is different from a traditional cash crop. We'll review your answers in just a moment. <laughs> Get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run, on the run. Hear them calling you and me. Every son of liberty. Hurry right away, no delay, go today. Make your daddy glad to have had such a lad. Tell your sweetheart not to pine, to be proud her boy's in line. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there, that the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the drums rum coming everywhere, so prepare, say a prayer, send the word, send the word to beware, we'll be over, we're coming over, and we won't come back. Till it's over, over there. I'll talk a little bit more about that video later, but let's review your responses to the warm up. Hopefully, you had five reasons for the start of World War II. Militarism, nations were arming themselves out of mutual fear and competition. Alliances, because of this fear, uh, were binding nations together and pretty much guaranteeing that tensions would escalate into massive conflict. Imperialism, which is the root of all of this because the competition for colonial holdings and resources led to advances in the military and the formation of the alliances. And then the, the reason for the assassination itself, the desire for self-rule in nationalism. The assassination is of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and this was an example of Serbian nationalism. Don't forget that nationalism can also be referred to as self-determination. The desire for self-rule. For the second question, remember that industrial crops were um, directly utilized in the manufacturing process. Cotton from African colonies and especially India supplied textile mills in Europe. Rubber was a popular commodity from Southeast Asia and equatorial regions in Africa and uh, was used to create the belts that were necessary to run machines. Palm oil from Southeast Asia was an excellent lubricant for factory machinery as well. Uh, cash crops such as tea, opium, coffee, sugar, and bananas were sold to consumers directly for consumption, therefore they were not considered industrial. After the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand and the July crisis that triggered the European alliance system, we shift to examining specifically militarism. Although College Board doesn't really dwell on the immediate outbreak of World War I, this is the first of a pattern of invasions that I think is kind of important for us to address. Um, so intense fighting began when France and Germany stared each other down along the shared and heavily fortified border, and then Germany snuck around back and attacked. This was called the Schlieffen Plan, one of France's most ridiculed moments in warfare. Germany's strategy hinged on avoiding a two-front war between Russia and France. The Schlieffen Plan tricked the French into believing they would attack along the shared border, but instead they circumvented the guaranteed heavy fighting and slipped through neutral Belgium, hoping to encircle Paris. For a variety of reasons, including Belgian resistance, uh, rapid British aid, rapid French mobilization, and last minute changes to the German plan, the Schlieffen Plan failed in its intention. But what it did do was create a massive expanse of complex trenches that expanded all the way to the English Channel as each side attempted to outflank the other. 
soldiers dug in, and a war of attrition began. A war of attrition is based on who will outlast the others. It's not a warfare of military movement and massive gains. It's essentially trying to just wear down your enemy to the point of collapse through continuous losses in personnel and war material. Now, at first, many people were excited about the prospect of joining the war. Each nation believed they were superior to the adversaries and that the fighting would be over by Christmas. Clearly, that is not what actually transpired. The West essentially had three years of stalemate with trenches from the English Channel all the way to Switzerland. Now, the East was slightly different. Russia went on the offensive more rapidly than the Central Powers anticipated, and they invaded German territory. But with over 6.5 million enlisted men carrying only 4.6 million rifles and one surgeon for every 10,000 soldiers, disaster was on the horizon for Russia. Tsar Nicholas II personally took command of the Russian army in 1917, hoping to boost morale and turn the war in Russia's favor, but it was the nail in the coffin for holding up the Eastern Front. Massive military losses combined with increasing food shortages from conscription and 500% inflation sparked the Russian Revolution in 1917. It also didn't hurt that Germany hand-delivered Vladimir Lenin, Russia's favorite exiled revolutionary, home to St. Petersburg in an armored train. Now, uh, despite the civil war that was going on, Russia continued to support the Allies until Lenin and the Bolsheviks won the Russian Revolution. Lenin signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk in March of 1918, which officially dropped Russia out of the war and placed a great deal of land in Germany and Austria-Hungary's control. This also reduced the two-front war to one. This takes us to our actual first learning objective. Explain how governments used a variety of methods to conduct war. And the key concept we're going to look at specifically now is new military technology and how it increased the levels of casualties. Now, trench warfare technically is not a technology, but it is a reaction to that technology. So we are going to look at that as well. World War I really amped up how mankind attempted to eradicate its own. So for the next few minutes, we'll look at the new technologies that revolutionized large-scale killing and the impact it had on those who survived. We'll specifically address airplanes, U-boats, zeppelins, poison gas, tanks, barbed wire, and machine guns. We'll start with airplanes, a technology only invented in 1905. The true impact of airplanes would not be utilized during World War I, but they were instrumental for spying on enemy lines and dropping the occasional bomb. The gun synchronizer was invented by the French in late 1914, allowing airplanes to mount machine guns that fired between the propeller blades, thus making them capable of shooting down enemy planes. By mid-1915, the technology was widespread and illustrious flying squadrons like the Lafayette Escadrille engaged in aerial dogfights. Flying aces like the legendary German Manfred von Richthofen, otherwise known as the Red Baron, had their victories tallied in local papers. The Red Baron had the most victories of any flying ace with 80 planes downed. The submarine was first used in the American Civil War, but in World War I, these underwater ships, now referred to as U-boats, took on whole new size and importance. Used to disrupt Atlantic and Mediterranean shipping, U-boats played a substantial role in attempting to bring England into submission by starving it out, and it was also the primary reason why the United States joined in World War I. Zeppelins were an alternative to airplanes at the onset of the war. Looking at this photograph, I want to mention that the United States will not develop an official air force until after World War II. Zeppelins were slow and silent. They could carry large payloads of explosives and often targeted industrial centers in the middle of the night. Towns often had sentries scanning the skies for dark areas where Zeppelins blocked the view of the stars. When this occurred, airplanes took off from local airfields to shoot them down, often successfully. Despite their susceptibility to the more maneuverable airplane, Zeppelins could carry quite a punch to civilian areas and were feared. Tanks were designed to traverse no man's land, the dangerous territory between trenches. They were bulky, had limited visibility and mobility, and weighed enough that they could easily get stuck in awkward places. Although they did not play a pivotal role in World War I, their potential was recognized and they would be mass produced in World War II. One of the worst military additions to warfare was chemical weapons. 
The first chemicals were deployed in 1915 by the Germans at the Second Battle of Ypres in Belgium. The French line was decimated. The rationale for using chemical weapons such as chlorine and mustard gases was to force troops out of the trenches in order to engage in combat. As soldiers fled, machine guns and bombs wreaked havoc on the retreating forces. Chemical weapons were deployed in a very simple manner. Canisters were set up on the outside of a trench when the wind was blowing towards the enemy trench, and then the lids were opened. The gases were heavier than the air and stayed close to the ground, filling in any spaces, like trenches. This was risky business, however, because if the wind shifted, your own troops could feel the impact instead. Chemical weapons caused burns in moist places. The eyes, nose, mouth, and lungs were particularly susceptible, and soldiers were soon outfitted with gas masks to protect them from blindness and suffocation. This did not protect them from the impact of moisture from the trenches and a lack of sanitation or even just being sweaty. Chemical burns were common along the back, armpits, and along the back of the neck where sweating is common. Useful war animals like horses, mules, and dogs were also outfitted with gas masks, usually, however, with little success. The machine gun had already played an important part in European imperialism, but this is really the first time that Europeans trained this formidable weapon on each other. At the onset of the war, each gun could fire 400 to 600 small caliber rounds per minute. By the end of the war, however, this rate doubled. The scale of casualties in the First World War was unprecedented. Thousands of soldiers were buried on battlefields where they lay or in communal graves with their comrades. Particularly bloody battles like Verdun and the Somme had upwards of 750,000 casualties and 300,000 deaths. With such high numbers, ossuaries were erected, like this one near Verdun, to accommodate the thousands of unidentified remains after the battle. It was because of the prodigious deaths in World War I that the United States recognized the need for military dog tags. But for those who survived, life was also very difficult. Injuries from poison gas were severe, as were the many head wounds from trench warfare. This prompted individuals to take steps towards rehabilitating disabled veterans into society. And one way to do so was through mask making. Anna Ladd was an American artist and sculptor who created lifelike masks to help mutilated soldiers who otherwise risked a lifetime of isolation for their incredible injuries. Her studio was filled with the castings of soldiers she aided through her work. In this photo, the top row is the original castings of the wounded veterans, and the bottom row is the mold she created to make the prosthetics. But a step more advanced than covering the injuries was the invention of plastic surgery to rectify them. These medical advances, as well as advances in battlefield medicine like the portable x-ray machine, saved more lives than ever before in battle. As if the weapons themselves weren't terrible enough, life in the trenches was equally horrific. Trenches were constructed to combat and defend against these new technologies. They became more elaborate with rows of support trenches behind the front lines to offer soldiers respite from battle. And no man's land between the trenches was an intimate reminder of the horrors of this new warfare, often littered with the new American pasture technology barbed wire. The dead were often ensnared or dismembered on the battlefield. Early trenches were often nothing more than ditches and usually had terrible sanitation. Over time, trenches were expanded and wooden floors were installed to offer protection from the soldier's worst enemy, trench foot. Uh, an infection could easily become gangrenous and result in amputation, and the only solution was to keep feet dry by frequently changing socks. Another threat, however, came in the form of rats. The putrid smell of decomposition, body odor, cooking, sewage, and lingering gas fumes drew in rats to the trenches and to no man's land. They ate what they, whatever they could get hold of and were extremely bold, often climbing underneath sleeping soldiers' uniforms or in their pockets. Lastly was the lice. Due to unsanitary conditions, lice infested the soldiers' hair and clothing and caused trench fever, a disease marked by high fever, weakness, headache, and severe back and shin pains. It's estimated that over a million soldiers suffered from the disease throughout the war. There really was no good method to remove the bugs except by hand picking them off clothing. These particular shoulder, soldiers are chatting or removing lice away from the front lines. Usually, however, within 24 hours, the infestation would reappear. 
There were a few notable positive moments in the war, the most famous of which is known as the Christmas Truce. On Christmas of 1914, after realizing that the war would not be a rapid victory, German and British soldiers took a risk and held an unofficial ceasefire in widespread areas of the Western Front. For the rest of the day, both sides cleared their dead, shared letters, food and gifts from home, sang carols, and even cleared no man's land to play a soccer match. This irritated high-ranking personnel who did not wish for their soldiers to put a human face on the target of their guns, and in some places it took weeks before soldiers would fire their weapons on the opposing trench. We have one more key concept to cover, and that is that World War I was the first total war. Governments used a variety of strategies, including political propaganda, art, media, and intensified forms of nationalism to mobilize populations, both in the home countries and in their colonies, for the purpose of waging war. The scope of the conflict of World War I created a third front, the home front. In cities all across Europe and eventually the United States, this was where war material like munitions were generated, where food for the front lines was canned, uniforms manufactured, and money raised. This is also why Zeppelins targeted cities. When a nation devotes so many resources to the success of a conflict, we call it total war. A total war mobilizes civilian populations to support war industries that benefit the military, and for greatest success, the government must step in to organize production priorities. This is in contrast to free trade capitalism, where consumers dictate demand and supply. Referred to as a command economy, government intervention is usually temporary until the crisis ends. That crisis can be war or economic depression, or it can be simply the basis for the state like fascism or communism. In Europe, where racial discrimination was not as profound as in the United States, the largest group available to provide the necessary workforce was women. Women of all socioeconomic backgrounds rallied to the workforce to replace their conscripted male counterparts. For middle and upper class women, this was a liberating experience that freed them from the walls of their homes. For other women, this was just business as usual. One way or another, their participation would finally gain them the franchise in post-war Europe and in the United States. To mobilize citizens to enlist, work, and donate to the war, governments used propaganda. These images were designed to elicit emotional response by heightening fear, exaggerating and dehumanizing the enemy, uh, appealing to the opposite sex, reinforcing family and social norms, inspiring nationalism, and offering hope. And yes, this is the birth of Uncle Sam. The film clips from the war tune over there illustrated the overwhelming zeal young men had to participate in this war. This was often quickly tempered by the conditions on the front and the intensity of battle. In addition, censorship was employed in newspapers to ensure that morale remained high and any criticism of the war could be considered treasonous. When the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, which we'll discuss later, spread like wildfire across the globe, many nations centered, censored its impact and its extent in order to keep the factories full, to keep troops on the line, and to keep money flowing into the economy. The resulting loss of life from the epidemic surpassed the deaths of both World Wars I and II combined. On a side note, I want to draw your attention to this particular propaganda poster and the cover of Vogue magazine from April 2008. This was a very controversial image as LeBron James was the first African American to be featured on the cover and the magazine did not run a story about World War I in the issue. With that in mind, take a moment to consider alternate messages that are reinforced by referencing the original propaganda poster. Not only did World War I rally the home front, it drew in millions of soldiers from outside Europe. The UK actively sought sepoys from India and troops from Australia, New Zealand, Newfoundland, Ireland, Kenya, and other African colonies. France and Germany did the same, fighting to preserve and expand their colonial possessions around the world. Some of the war's worst casualties came from fighting at Gallipoli, near the Strait of Marmara on the Anatolian Peninsula. Ottoman soldiers engaged in intense fighting with Anzac forces in blistering heat and squalid conditions. Over 150,000 soldiers would perish in the Ottoman victory. This international participation provided Japan with another opportunity to intervene in civil war ravaged China. In the interests of European allies, Japan expelled Germany from its extraterritorial holdings in China, those spheres of influence. 
Japan then continued to march on China, demanding even greater capitulations called the 21 Demands. That essentially would have reduced the nation to a Japanese protectorate. Eventually, Britain intervened and Japan had to back down, but this will be just a warm-up for Japan's expansionist policy during World War II. One more nation that we have yet to fully incorporate is the United States. The U.S. was loath to become involved in a European conflict, preferring instead to offer loans and sell munitions to its allies from across the Atlantic. These were all done with the understanding that debts would be paid back after an allied success, but as the war dragged into a bloody third year, banks became nervous. Also recall that the U.S. had a substantial European immigrant population at the turn of the century. The social impact of targeting the motherlands of so many was a situation that the government really wished to avoid. In addition, German U-boats were blockading British ports and sinking merchant vessels carrying war material. Then, on May 7, 1915, the British passenger ship Lusitania, which was secretly smuggling ammunition from Ireland to Britain, was sunk with 128 U.S. passengers aboard. Combined with the interception of the Zimmerman telegram, the prospect of continuing U.S. No neutrality was slim. The Zimmerman telegram was a damning January 1917 German communique with Mexico, offering them the return of Texas and other lands lost to the United States if they would open a North American front to keep the U.S. out of Europe. Combined with Germany's threat of unrestricted submarine warfare, these events prompted the United States to declare war in April of 1917. By the time U.S. troops arrived in Europe, the war was wreaking havoc on everyone. The British were battling Irish nationals, food shortages were severe in Eastern Europe, the Ottoman Empire's infrastructure was decimated, French soldiers mutinied, um, and a massive German offensive designed to end the war before the U.S. arrived failed. Include a new crop of enthusiastic young recruits fresh from the Americas, and the war of attrition went to the Allies. The U.S. was not hailed for its innovative military tactics in World War I so much as it was just bringing so many more dogs to the fight. Enthusiasm would remain high among allied nations as the treaty process began. Unfortunately, as we will see in Chapter 7.5, the punishments meted out to Germany in the Treaty of Versailles would do much to unravel the fragile peace from the Great War. As we wrap up Chapter 7.3 in the Great War, take a moment to do a learning check on what we've covered. Can you explain how new military technology led to increased levels of wartime casualties? Explain the features of total war and its social and economic consequences. Explain the techniques employed by nations to mobilize their populations and explain the global expansion of the war. If not, delve a little deeper into the ancillary materials on my website or ask me some questions. See you in class. Bent double, like old beggars under sacks. Not knee, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge. Till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched to sleep. Many had lost their boots but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue. Death even to the hoots of disappointed shells that dropped behind. Gas, gas, quick boys. An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If, in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil sick of sin. If you could hear, at every jolt, the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children, ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dulce et decorum est, pro patria mori.